recording. So welcome to our seminar, so dear friends, dear colleagues. So it is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Damek Davis from Cornell University. So Damek received his PhD in mathematics from uh, the University of California. One of his supervisors was Watawin and moved one year later to Cornell University uh, on the position of assistant professor. So he's, uh, he has a very broad research profile, uh, work in optimization, in, in numerical method mathematics, but it's also very much interested in application data science, statistics, in processing, machine learning. He's uh, one of the, let's say, most promising, most successful young colleagues, young mathematicians in, in our field, already uh, received several awards. It's my pleasure to mention the Informs Optimization Young Researchers Prize, but uh, the Slow Research, also the Slow Research Fellowship Mathematics, and uh, that make uh, received an NSF Career Award this, this year, 2021. So thank you for accepting our invitation. Yeah. It's, our, it's, our, it's our great pleasure yeah, uh, to have you in our seminar. Tamek, you have 45 minutes for a talk. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you so much. And thank you for the introduction. I really appreciate it. Um, so today I wanna tell everyone about um, some recent work that I've been, been doing in the last couple of years with um, my collaborator, Dima Dostratsky at University of Washington and uh, my student, Li Wei Zhang at Cornell. Um, this talk is on um, avoiding saddle points and non-smooth optimization, which is something I've been thinking about for quite a long time. Um, so the the talk is basically motivated by um, the excellent empirical performance that we see for very simple algorithms, things like stochastic gradient methods in um, in machine learning. Um, you know, for training things like deep neural networks. And you know, after people started seeing this in the last decade, that you know these algorithms are uh, performing so well on these problems, they sort of realized and sort of codified this as a, as a, as a theorem um, that uh, simple algorithms for, um, you know, sufficiently smooth optimization, things like gradient descent and coordinate descent, avoid all strict saddle points of, 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 of the functions that we're trying to optimize. And these are critical points that have negative curvature, as long as you randomly initialize them. And so, on the right here, what I'm showing is a function which has a, a critical point at the origin and it has a direction of negative curvature. And you can see that on the left, I randomly initialize um, a gradient method uh, at, at many different points and I run the gradient descent algorithm. And what I see is that um, the, uh, the iterates, the initial points eventually leave uh, the saddle point except for that one that started at zero. And so seeing this, um, this result, uh, the machine learning community sort of verified that, um, that for most problems, the geometry is, is not so bad, or for, for a variety of problems, the geometry is not so bad in the sense that um, you, know, you run these simple first order methods, they converge to um, uh, local minimizers, which are potentially nearly global minimizers. And um, they never converge to spurious critical points, which are these points that have this negative curvature. And so, you know, this, this result um, came about, but, you know, has obvious precursors in the dynamical systems literature, but it came about in 2016 in the machine learning community and motivated a ton of work. And since that time, I've really been trying to think about whether something similar can be shown for, for um, non-smooth optimization algorithms. And that's the, the goal of, of, of this talk is to try to generalize at least the algorithmic guarantee to non-smooth problems. Generalizing the sort of verification and applications is, is a much harder, I mean, not a much harder problem, but a, 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 a separate problem that is also very hard. Um, and so that's what we wanna talk about today. Do first order methods and non-smooth optimization converge to local minimizers? Now, what is really known at, at this point for sort of general non-smooth problems is that, you know, eventually you converge to a critical point not, uh, not, not a local minimizer. And so really that's the extent of what we know for simple first order methods. All right, so um, this is what we wanna answer. And so we should uh, narrow our focus a little bit to some non-smooth um, problem class. And the problem class that I wanna introduce is sort of deceptively simple, but surprisingly broad. And this is the, the weakly convex class. Um, so we're going to be minimizing a function f and our running assumption is that the function can be convexified by adding uh, some quadratic to it with some amplitude rho. And so the function is going to be globally convexified just by adding a small function rho. 
Now this looks like a very simple modification of the convex um, class, but it turns out that it covers a lot of different um, um, uh, problems. Um, namely those, like the, the main example that I wanna consider are those that are in the um, convex composite class. These are functions which are the composition of a convex Lipschitz continuous function with a smooth mapping, okay? And so in particular, this class covers the convex class and it covers the smooth class. Of course, the convex is not non-convex, but um, it covers these two things together and then arbitrary compositions. Now, this has been um, you know, a very well-studied class for, for a number of years, uh, particularly in, in, in nonlinear programming and uh, sequential quadratic programming uh, problems. And so you know, people have looked at this for a very long time. It's a very natural problem class. More generally, um, uh, recently people have sort of started looking at these formulations in statistical um, signal processing applications. So let me give you just one brief example of that, um, that application, which I find pretty interesting and I've done some work on this before. So um, one problem that's very common in um, data science is trying to estimate an unknown matrix, um, which, which is low rank, which is an, an assumption that we're gonna place on the matrix from a series of linear measurements that are observed approximately, okay? And so this problem, although it seems um, uh, you know, pretty, pretty simple, actually covers a lot of applications, things like matrix completion. So this is what you'll see in, in recommendation systems, like how Netflix offers you movie recommendations, um, robust PCA and, and, and phase retrieval. And the key enabling assumption here that allows us to sort of recover this matrix with very, very few observations is that the underlying matrix that we're trying to find is known to be low rank. Okay, so we have, um, this is a very common problem. I, I don't wanna get too, too far into the applications today, but suffice it to say, um, you know, if you're given this problem as an optimizer, maybe the first thing that you would try is, um, um, if you're going to use non-convex optimization, is to simply minimize the measurement misfit. So we have our linear operator A, we have our measurements, and we can search for a low rank matrix M. So here we explicitly enforce that constraint, and we, we penalize the deviation, yeah, right? So it looks like a, almost like a least squares type of problem. Now, in general, this, this constraint uh, requires working with a full dimensional variable, um, which is, uh, and, and if we're going to run simple first order methods on it, it will require things like projection onto the feasible set. And so in 2001, um, Biron Montero decided, uh, sort of popularized this technique of um, uh, formulating the constraint uh, explicitly inside the model and replacing the matrix M with the parameterization of, of low rank matrices. Uh, as an outer product of D by R matrices. And so now you see that the optimization variable is, is, is potentially very small if R is very small, and it suggests the following convex composite loss function for the problem we're trying to consider. So here we have a outer convex norm composed with a smooth mapping, in fact, a quadratic mapping. And so this is really um, sort of one of the main examples that people consider for weekly convex problems and applications. And so once you see this problem, of course, the natural question is, you know, is there a natural norm that we can choose that will enable recovery? And so, uh, you know, people who work primarily with sort of smooth problems would think, you know, if I use L2 here, I can easily smooth this. So, you know, we're not really dealing with non-smooth problems, but in fact, there are other norms that you may want to consider. Um, of course, the L2 norm is a norm that, uh, you know, is popularized in the work of Kendes and Tao for these statistical recovery problems in particular things like restricted isometry property. And it turns out that that is a very appropriate norm for um, Gaussian matrices, Gaussian measurement matrices and Gaussian corruption in our, in our data. And of course that will lead to a smooth problem because you can always square this, um, this objective and you'll get a smooth optimization problem. However, there are some instances, namely when the matrix is structured, let's say an outer product of two, two Gaussians, right? Like it's a, it's, a, it's a matrix form from the outer product of two Gaussians, or when we know that there's some underlying corruption in the, um, the measurement process that sort of corrupts some of the measurements, um, but maybe not others, then a natural norm to consider in this case would be the, the L1 norm, and we'll, this will result in a non-smooth problem. Now you could try to smooth this problem, but um, our goal here today is to, to sort of work with this type of problem directly rather than um, uh, going through the whole smoothing process, because that can introduce a, other, other issues for the problem itself, namely bad conditioning. So, okay, so we wanna work directly with this, with, with the class of non-smooth problems. 
So let's just keep this in your mind as a, as a running example in the background. We won't really um, revisit it again, but this is sort of the problem class that I'm, that I'm interested in. All right, so now that we have this problem class, the natural question is what, what types of algorithms um, uh, can we consider for non-smooth optimization and which algorithms might avoid saddle points? Okay, so it turns out that in, in non-smooth optimization and even in smooth optimization, a variety of common iterative methods can be written um, in a very concise way. The idea of, of, of this formulation is that given your function f at the current iterate xt, you linearize or you do some sort of um, uh, simplification of your function to get a model of the function you're trying to optimize, which is um, potentially non-smooth, but is definitely um, strongly convex. Okay. Then you declare the minimizer of this model, this simplification of your function, to be the minimizer of the problem. Okay, so that's simple enough. That's a, a variety of algorithms are covered by that. Let me give you a couple of examples. So, um, so you might be wondering, how are we going to get a strongly convex model of the function we're trying to optimize? This is what weak convexity buys you. Weak convexity tells you that if you add a quadratic to your function sufficiently large, then the function becomes convex. Uh, in fact, if we add an even bigger one, we can make the function strongly convex. And so a classical algorithm, the proximal point method, um, simply would add a big quadratic centered at the current point and then minimize this, um, this model of the function. And as you can see, the next iterate here would be actually at the solution. So this is not a bad model of the function. And we can optimize it um, to any, any accuracy that we want um, because this function is, is strongly convex, although the algorithm may not be that quick. Okay, so that's one natural example. But of course, if you have more structure in your problem, you can, you can um, uh, be more clever in your choice of models. So for example, if I have a convex composite, I might take the smooth part, which I know um, is well approximated by linear function, and I might linearize that inside the non-smooth um, loss and simply minimize uh, the non-smooth loss plus a quadratic, right? And so this is, of course, a convex function composed with a linear function, so it's convex. The whole function is strongly convex. And what you see is that this model also gives you a pretty good next iterate, which is closer to the minimizer than the previous one. And of course, you can go on and on and uh, build up these models. Let me just mention one last one that, um, that you, you might be thinking, which is the um, proximal gradient method. And oh, one thing I forgot to mention is that in all of these formulations, you can, you can, you can include things like regularization by simply leaving the function that is your regularizer or your constraint alone in the problem and simply performing the model operation on the function you're trying to optimize. And so, so um, one last one I wanted to mention is the proximal gradient algorithm, which simply takes, um, you, you have a smooth function plus a potentially non-smooth regularizer or constraint, in particular, this can be infinite valued, and you linearize the smooth function um, and leave this, this alone, and you'll get the, you know, the, the common proximal gradient um, uh, algorithm. All right, so this is sort of the, the class of algorithms that I'm interested in. And so for this class of algorithms, the question then is, um, you know, do they avoid saddle points? Um, so in, in order to answer this question, we have to really be clear on what we mean by a saddle point in non-smooth optimization. And so this is what um, my, my um, work back in 2019 with um, Dmitry Dusvatsky tried, tried to answer. Um, and in order to get a sense of what the answer is uh, or the answer that we provided, it's really instructive to go back to the smooth setting and sort of try to build up the example um, case by case. So let's go back to the C2 smooth setting. In that case, we know that um, a strict saddle point is simply a critical point where the Hessian has a negative eigenvalue. Okay, so it has at least one negative eigenvalue. Now, thinking about generalizing this beyond C2 functions, to e let's say even C1 functions, requires replacing the Hessian with some sort of other object because it may not exist. And so looking at this expression, one thing you might think of is that, well, well, maybe I can just kind of deal with this directionally. Maybe the function is sort of a directionally smooth function on, along some ray. And so a natural generalization attempt for this problem is to say that a strict saddle point is a critical point of my function along which um, there exists a direction or a ray where the function f is C2 and the function g has some amount of negative curve, has some amount of negative curvature um, at zero, and of course this is an equivalent definition of of the strict saddle property when f is c two. But we might expect that we can use this to extend um, the strict saddle concept beyond this, the class of c two functions. Okay, but it turns out that 
even for C1 functions, this type of definition will not work. And so let me give you a brief example. So here on the left, I'm plotting a, um, a C1 loss function, which happens to be what's a, a natural smoothing of this, of this weakly convex function called the Moreau envelope. And um, this is a C1 function, which has a Lipschitz gradient. So it's, you know, it's, it's pretty smooth. And along the, the y-axis, the function is simply a negative quadratic. And so it is C2, it has negative curvature, it, it looks great. However, if you imagine running gradient descent on this function, I kind of think about it as like rolling a ball around in the graph. You'll, you'll kind of think if I, if I end up in this crevice of the function, I will get drawn right to the origin, right? I won't really be able to escape that origin. And in fact, um, if we look at the gradient flow generated by the function, which is shown in all these, these arrows, there's a cone of initial conditions where if I start the gradient flow within this cone, I will get attracted to the x-axis and then eventually be driven to the origin. If I start anywhere out here, I will be driven off to um, you know, negative infinity and, and escape the origin, which has that clear saddle structure. Um, but anywhere within this cone, I will get stuck. Now, um, this cone, of course, has positive measure, and we could make this cone arbitrarily bad by widening it or, and placing it in higher dimensions. And so this example tells us that we can make an example that um, uh, where gradient descent with probability arbitrarily close to one um, with random initialization will converge to um, uh, a, a strict saddle point of this function in, in, in the definition you just provided. And so this is clearly not enough even for C1 functions. And so, um, so, so sort of getting around this definition is what, um, is, is what motivates our, our main um, uh, definition for the strict saddle property. And so what is the key problem here? The problem is that um, although you know, we do have this negative curvature, we are not reaching the region where we have the negative curvature, namely the y-axis, fast enough. We can't reach it fast enough to, to actually benefit from that negative curvature. And so a natural condition to sort of you know, fix this uh, issue is to just assume that the gradient curves are actually fast. And so um, in order to do that, a very natural assumption is to assume that the function sort of looks very like sharp, like it's the, that if you roll a ball down the hill, it'll get there very quickly. And um, sort of a more analytic way of thinking about it is that the subgradient or the, the gradient flow that we're looking at has constant speed or at least constant speed as you approach the, the, the axis. And so that would be signified by saying that its velocity, which is the norm of the gradient, is bounded below, right, off the axis. And so this, will, this sort of property will ensure that the gradient flow actually aims towards the axis with constant speed. And it leads to a structure that looks sort of like what I'm, what I'm plotting here, where you have this very sharp structure and then um, uh, a negative curvature along the y-axis. And as you can see, the sort of the lines of the flow are all constant size. As we approach the axis, we benefit from that negative curvature and we get sort of pushed off, um, off to infinity and we don't converge to uh, the sort of obvious saddle sitting at the origin here. The only region in which we converge to the saddle is if we start on the x-axis itself, then we will be drawn directly to the saddle. So we have this negative curvature. Okay, so this is a very simple looking structure. And of course, like not all functions have this structure where they're like along an axis or along a subspace, et cetera, that we have this sort of sharp looking growth and maybe some negative curvature along that ray. And so a natural idea is to try to replace this ray of smoothness with something else. And so, so how can we generalize this result? Well, the key idea is to just kind of go back to something which is, you know, very, uh, very classical at this point um, when dealing with non-smooth optimization is to replace that ray of smoothness with it, instead with something non-linear. Um, uh, in this case, what we'll call an active manifold of smoothness. And we say that uh, a function has um, an active manifold of smoothness if within the domain of the function, there's a manifold, the function varies smoothly along the manifold and in the directions normal to the manifold, the manifold is growing sharply. So it has that sort of V, V-like structure. And what I'm showing here is a, a generalization of the, of the sort of lower bound on the gradient norm to, to non-smooth functions uh, using a, a, a generalized gradient of the weakly convex function class. I'll come back to what this, exactly what this is later on, but that's, um, that's the definition that I'm gonna propose. And so what that leads to is sort of a curvy sort of uh, structure 
where along that curvy structure, we are going very sharp. So in this case, the active manifold looks like um, basically the, a, a sine curve. Um, and we are, uh, you can see that the gradient curves are, 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 um, uh, are bounded below based on this size of the level sets. So, okay, so this is what we, we wanna work with. Um, but of course, looking at this example, we we forgot about curvature. And so the natural question then is, is well, like, how do we incorporate curvature back in? All right, so we have this loss function. It has this active manifold um, uh, along the x-axis and the function is smooth along the manifold. It's just a negative quadratic. And so we wanna extract that smooth structure in order to think about saddle points of this function. And so the sort of the simplest way that you could do this is to just take the function and develop its smooth extension off the manifold. So the function is smooth on the manifold. This is a locally um, a smooth uh, mapping, the projection mapping onto the manifold. And so you'll, you're able to at least locally extend the function off radially from the manifold. And so that motivates the, the definition that we ultimately settled on, which is called the active strict saddle property. The key word is that we have this activity we don't just have a strict saddle, we have an activity, um, and that's going to be key for us. And what we say is that a, a critical point, um, uh, x bar of the function f is an active strict saddle if f has this active manifold structure. Um, so there's some active manifold in the domain. And the smooth extension of the function along this manifold has the strict saddle point property. Right? And so this, the Hessian of this function has a negative eigenvalue. Now we do have um, variants of this property that do not require knowing the manifold M. We could, they can be stated solely in terms of the function itself, but this is a very convenient um, definition to work with uh, theoretically. So let's stick with that. Okay, so this is, this is the property. And so now that we have it, um, oh yeah, I wanna say one last thing. This is the property. Does it hold, right? Does it hold for anything? It looks pretty, it looks pretty rigid, right? We have to assume that there's a manifold in the domain where you smooth and then you have some negative curvature. Um, it looks very stringent, stringent. And so the question is, um, does it actually hold in practice? And so our model for sort of thinking about that problem is to, to ask whether it holds maybe, let's say for a generic function. Um, and so what we're able to show is that if your function F is semi-algebraic or more generally from um, the tame class of functions and weakly convex, then for almost all tilts of the function, so if you take the function and sort of tilt it in any one direction, um, and for almost all tilts, the function that the tilted function um, has a very nice critical point structure in the sense that every critical point either has this activity with the active manifold and the negative curvature, or it's a local minimizer of the function. And so what this tells us is that the example that we started off with, with the C1 smooth function is, is highly unstable. Small linear tilts of this function, if I tilt it in any way, will not have this behavior. You won't be able to converge to um, this origin unless it's a, a local minimizer of the tilt. Okay. And so this is, of course, not saying that uh, anything about structured perturbations. This is just for arbitrary perturbations of the function, and, but it offers a model for how prevalent this could possibly be. Okay. So now that we know that the property exists and happens for a variety of problems, the natural question then is how do algorithms avoid these properties? And so um, the algorithms that we're going to consider are those three that I showed in that table at the beginning. The pro these are proximal algorithms. And the question is, do these avoid active strict saddle? Our strategy is going to borrow the exact argument from the smooth setting, but we have to um, you know, be very careful in order to, to extend it to our setting. And this is based on what's called the stable manifold theorem in dynamical systems, a very classical theorem um, that you'll learn if you take this, those types of courses. And the key, uh, the key sort of for applying this theorem is to view the iterative algorithms that we've constructed so far as a fixed point iteration of some well-behaved operator T. And so this is, of course, um, uh, you know, we're just applying the same operation again and again. And so you should expect, uh, in order for the strategy to make sense, that the minimizers of the function are, are fixed points and the saddle points are fixed points. And it turns out for all the problems that we consider, they are actually fixed points of this operation. And so you know, just, just stepping back, let's now consider um, a fixed point operation, a fixed point iteration on some well-behaved operator. And um, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a sense of what happens in the smooth setting. Okay, so here's the recipe for smooth functions. We have a fixed point iteration, which is just generated by the gradient, the uh, I don't know how to call this, I guess the gradient descent mapping. Um, and so this is equivalently how one might write gradient descent. Now, um, 
strict saddle points of this function f, you know, which are critical points with negative curvature, um, require that the function we're trying to optimize has a negative eigenvalue. It's Hessian has a negative eigenvalue at the critical point. In addition, critical points are clearly fixed points of this operator because the gradient is zero. And so it turns out that these two properties translate into nice properties for the, um, the fixed point operator. Namely, strict saddle points are what are known as unstable fixed points of the operator, meaning that the Jacobian of the operator has at least one eigenvalue of magnitude greater than one. And this is exactly what this Hessian condition is saying. Okay. And so these unstable fixed points have you know, sort of a clear interpretation of, being, um, of having uh, some direction along which the operator expands the space. And that's what the Jacobian being greater than one uh, eigenvalue um, signifies. And so you should expect that there's some direction along which we can expand the space. Hopefully that will push us away from these unstable fixed points. Now, a lot is known about these unstable fixed points. In particular, one thing that we, we need uh, in order to apply this, um, this result is what's called the center stable manifold theorem. And I won't say what the theorem is, but essentially what it does is it implies that the, um, the, the set of initial conditions, which can possibly converge to unstable fixed points, if I iterate the operator forever, if I run gradient descent forever, is small. It has Lebesgue measure zero. So we, 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 we have a very small set of initial conditions where we can converge to these bad points. And because of that, we know that if, since this set is small, we know that if we take random initialization from a continuous distribution, let's say uniform in some box or um, Gaussian, we will not land within this set of bad initial conditions. And so the algorithms will avoid those strict saddle points eventually. And so that will give us the proof that gradient descent avoids those um, strict saddle points. And um, clearly it requires, um, you know, uh, some, some properties for the operator T, it's not true for everything. So for example, it requires the operator T to be differentiable at the point of interest, right? And um, um, uh, that is guaranteed by, you know, the C2 property of the functions, but also it requires one extra thing, which I didn't mention, that the, um, the operator T is a local diffeomorphism, and we'll, we'll come back to that in, in a second, um, but uh, it will be insured by for, for the problems that we consider. Okay, so, so this is really the recipe. And now we wanna extend this to, um, to our iterative algorithms. Okay. So, um, so to apply this argument, what do we need? We need local smoothness of the iteration mapping, right? Because this is gonna be our fixed point mapping. I'm using a different letter S now instead of T, for a reason that will become apparent in a second. So we need to show that this update mapping is C1 near the active strict saddle point and is a local diffeomorphism. Okay, so those are the two things we need to show. In addition, we need to show that those active strict saddle points are actually unstable fixed points of this operator, meaning that the Jacobian of this operator um, has an eigenvalue of magnitude greater than one. Okay, so what we're going to do is focus solely on the first thing, local smoothness, the other calculation is a bit more involved and changes for every algorithm that you look at. But the smoothness calculation is not so, so difficult. So let's focus on that. Okay, so the function f that we're optimizing is non-smooth, yet this update mapping is somehow smooth. How can this be? Well, it turns out that the key reason why this update mapping is smooth is that uh, is what's known as identification. So the sharpness condition, this constant speed of the gradient curve, will guarantee that all the algorithms that we, we, we want to study will reach the active manifold very, very quickly in the sense that after a finite number of iterations of those algorithms, they will the output uh, of those mappings will actually be inside the manifold near that point. And so I'll give you a quick example here with this, um, this, this function. Here, the active manifold is the solution itself. It's a zero dimensional active manifold. And we'll see that the proximal point algorithm started at point five, if we look at the minimizer of this function, which will be the next iterate, it will lie at the solution, which is the active manifold. So we have that identification nearby. Turns out that's key. And importantly, we don't actually have to know what that active manifold is. It just exists. It's in the background. We know it exists, right? So we didn't have to know it in order to know that we identified. So the consequence of this, let me state it for simplicity in terms of the proximal point method rather than in the other algorithms, is the following. So our operator S, is, is formed from minimizing a strongly convex function. 
we know that the output of S is inside M near the solution or the saddle point. Therefore, we can simply add a constraint to our optimization problem that the variable that we're optimizing over is inside the manifold. Because of that, what we're doing is we're essentially minimizing a smooth function over a smooth manifold locally, even if we don't know it. Okay, so we're trying to find that minimizer. And so based on that, uh, sort of a classical argument uh, plus weak convexity, which enables some sort of quadratic growth and uh, sort of inverse function theorem type arguments implies that the, that the mapping S is C1 near X bar. And that's all you need to show. The key is that the function F is C1 on, uh, it, that is smooth on this smooth manifold and that's what we're optimizing. Okay, so that's, so that's, that's the reason why this ma mapping is locally smooth. Now, a similar um, argument, but a little bit more complicated will extend to the other three methods, which I listed before. In particular, it extends to infinite value functions R, um, so encoding things like constraints. And um, it yields the following theorem that um, this operator is locally smooth. And in addition, something we didn't show is that um, the, the Jacobian has an eigenvalue um, greater than one. And in fact, the eigenvalue is real, surprisingly. Um, so this proof is more surprising and interesting for the proximal gradient and proximal linear method, but let's not go into that so much. Um, uh, for the proximal point, it's really conceptually clear what's happening. All right, so one problem with this result so far is that we didn't really verify um, the last condition, which is that the mapping S needs to be a local diffeomorphism. But there's a very easy solution to this. Um, the mapping S is, is sort of Lipschitz enough. It's kind of Lipschitz near the active strict saddles. So, it turns out that if you if you sort of damp the iteration, the mapping that comes out will be a local diffeomorphism um, based on based on very simple arguments. And so what this tells us is that um, if you randomly initialize the proximal point, proximal gradient, or proximal linear method, and you add a little bit of damping to them, these algorithms will all this locally escape um, strict saddle points. Now these results hold when S is globally Lipschitz um, globally. Right. So when S is globally Lipschitz, we can globalize this argument. And this is known to be true for the proximal point and proximal gradient method. However, when, when the mapping is not globally Lipschitz, uh, we get the prox, uh, so for example, the prox uh, linear method, we can't globalize the strategy. So a natural open question is whether you can actually globalize this. Um, and we, we, we tried for some time, we'd have no idea um, how to do it. Okay, so um, um, sort of wrapping up this section, there's a limitation of this result in that it only applies to these three proximal methods that we've written down. And um, you know we can't always run these proximal methods. For example, the argument really, really needs you to have exact solutions to the subproblems you're trying to solve. And so numerically, this is not easy to do um, in all cases, maybe easier in the prox gradient case than others. And in addition, the structure that we have here right, is not always available. Functions can be given to us as more of a black box in some cases, or at least we want to be able to consider such functions. And so what we're going to do is, is consider an alternative to this strategy based on um, uh, uh, the subgradient method. Now I want to pause just one second. Radu, how much time do I have uh, at this point? Or what time does it end? Uh, let's say 15 more minutes. OK, perfect. Thank you. Um, all right, so now I want to get into this alternative, which is the subgradient method. So in order to, to tell you about this result, I, I really need to call recall sort of a formal definition of the subgradient for weakly convex functions. So the, for weakly convex functions, the subgradient is, is very closely related to the subgradient of convex functions. You, um, you satisfy a subgradient inequality, which basically says that while convex functions have a linear supporting hyperplane, weakly convex functions always have a supporting quadratic at, at every point with the same fixed amplitude. And so, we have a natural subgradient inequality that, um, that is satisfied for, for vectors Vx whenever F is um, row weakly convex. And what we do is we just like take to, uh, collect together all those slopes of all possible quadratics that sit below our graph and touch at a given point and call that our subdifferential. Now, of course, um, the, the, the interesting thing is that we, we can actually compute these things based off of a extensive calculus. Um, if we know that, for example, we have a convex composite, we have a formal chain rule that actually holds and, and, and works. And more generally, these things are closely related to minimizing properties of the function we're trying to optimize. Uh, for example, if you know your point is a local minimizer, then you have um, zero inside the subdifferential, which is, a, which is a critical point. 
And so that's just a, a rapid review of the subdifferential of weakly convex function. Now we can take these subgradients and we can use them inside of an algorithm. Okay, and so this is the idea of the subgradient method. At time t, what do we do? Well, we linearize f in some sense by computing some subgradient at a given point um, xt. This is the iterate. We form the linearization of the function with a linear model, and we add a little quadratic to it, which will be um, uh, important in a, in a second. It gives us a strongly convex function, and this is our model. Then we simply minimize the strongly convex function. And what comes out at the other end is something that looks a lot like gradient descent with a generalized gradient, okay? So of course, um, what's happening here is we are approximating this non-smooth function by a quadratic function. This is going to be a really poor approximation. And so we're going to have to boost up this alpha t in order to make sure that we take a smaller and smaller step size. Um, but in any case, we can do this. And uh, it has clear benefits if, if you know, we can't do proximal methods in that we can actually compute some gradients for a, a wide variety of functions. And, and typically they're, they're computable with things like matrix vector products. And we can often replace VT in addition with uh, the results of an um, auto differentiation procedure like what comes out of um, uh, Google's TensorFlow library and, and similar results will hold. And so this has clear benefits. And, and, and so a natural question is whether this type of algorithm, the subgradient method or, or related methods avoid the active strict saddle points that we've already defined. Now there's a couple of difficulties. Um, the first one is a huge difficulty because we, we our, our complete, our, our strategy that we introduced for the proximal method completely fails uh, in the sense that identification of the active manifold never holds. We, 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 we are almost never inside that manifold and we, and we shouldn't expect to be inside that manifold with a, a vanilla subgradient method. And so because of that, it's unclear how we should leverage the smoothness of the function on the manifold. Now, our recent work uh, prevents, pre presents one strategy for overcoming these difficulties, which is based essentially at, at a high level on or developing an orthogonal decomposition of the trajectory of the algorithm. And so this orthogonal decomposition of the trajectory is, is uh, what could be called a VU decomposition of the function, which is a, a very nice technique um, that uh, takes our non-smooth function and separates it out into sort of the sharp looking component and the uh, smooth component. And so we have this V structure and the U structure. And the U is upside down in this case. Usually it's the other way, but now it's upside down. Okay, and these are some, in some sense orthogonal functions. Um, in particular, they allow you to take our subgradient method, which is in general, you know, iteration of a set valued mapping, a very complicated process, and decompose it into two pieces. First of all, it allows you to decompose it in terms of tangent directions. Namely, the, um, we can look at the, at the iteration along the active manifold here, and we'll see that it looks a lot like we're performing gradient descent on the smooth part of the function, which is this fu. In addition, we can look at what's happening in the normal direction to the manifold, which is like these directions you know, going off in that direction along here. And in the normal direction, which is what what I'm showing here, it looks like gradient descent on the, um, the non-smooth part, this V, okay? And so it turns out that you can make this, this rigorous by imposing two assumptions on the problem you're trying to optimize, and I'm gonna impose them both on this non-smooth part. So first of all, um, um, the, the condition that, that we, we first imposed is what's called aiming. And this aiming condition ensures that negative subgradients always aim towards the, the active manifold. And so you're sort of making progress steadily towards that active manifold. And that's what this, this condition um, signifies. It's a consequence of sharpness plus another condition, um, which, uh, which is called B regularity in our paper on this topic, but um, let's ignore that for now. The second condition is that the function doesn't vary very much in tangent directions, right? This non-smooth part, which I'm showing here, looks almost, which is actually constant in tangent directions to the manifold. And so we can, we can encode that by saying that the gradients inside tangent directions tend to zero as we approach the manifold in this sort of Lipschitz-like fashion. And those are the, the two conditions that we postulate. And in fact, um, they may look stringent as well, but it turns out that if we um, look at semi-algebraic functions, these types of properties are true generically for weakly convex semi-algebraic functions. And so these are actual real things that, that, that we can assume and deal with. And so based on these two properties, uh, we have two pillars uh, of, for analyzing the subgradient method. 
And so essentially the two, the two pillars of the, of, of the method is that because we have the aiming and we have the smoothness and tangent direction, um, we can ensure that the iterates of the subgradient methods steadily approach the active manifold. And so here, I, I picture some manifold M, here, in the iterate, here are the iterates of the algorithm. They never reach the active manifold, but they sort of zigzag across it and get closer and closer and closer. And so this, prop, this type of behavior is actually true generically for these, for these functions. And in fact, you reach the manifold at a rate that depends on the step size that you're choosing. But there are of course limits to that. You don't go faster than let's say linear. The second question or the second property or pillar is that we can examine the iterates of the algorithm along the manifold and deal only with the smooth function. In particular, these red dots here, which are the projections or the shadow of the, the iterate sequence along the manifold, form a Riemannian gradient sequence on the manifold. In other words, they look like um, we're taking a step with respect to the Riemannian gradient of the manifold along the manifold, plus some error, which accounts for some um, retraction of the function. And that's really coming from the smooth and tangent directions condition, right? That, that I listed before um, and ensures that you have this property. So now looking at this, uh, of course, if you, if you can show, if you can somehow leverage the smoothness of F along the manifold, right? Because we know that gradient descent doesn't converge to, to strict saddle points. The function will have a strict saddle point along the manifold if and only if it has a strict saddle point, um, you know, more globally for the non-smooth function. And so you might expect that we can apply stable manifold type theorem arguments to conclude that this YT doesn't converge to a saddle, so XT doesn't converge to a saddle. Now, it turns out that it's more difficult um, than that because we have this error. And this, there, this error prevents us from applying the stable manifold theorem. There is a stable manifold theorem with errors that you can apply, but the errors have to be structured and Lipschitz. And so we can't actually apply that, that type of result. And so really we have to resort to a different strategy for trying to show that these YT don't converge to a saddle point. And that strategy is, um, is, is simply to, to add perturbations of, of, of the, um, to, to, the, to the function. And I guess the one point I wanted to make here, which I forgot to make, is that what's happening is we're getting to the manifold quickly enough to ensure that locally, we're getting this Riemannian gradient structure. And hopefully we can use that structure to say that we don't converge to saddle points. And so here you see, we're getting an error on the order of alpha t squared. Okay, so the idea then is to take this, um, this, this iteration and add a small perturbation to it. The hope is that if we keep adding perturbations to the subgradient at every time step, that we might pick up directions of negative curvature. And here I just sample them uniformly on the ball. You could sample them um, in, in many other ways as well, as long as you have like some support on those directions of negative curvature of the function. All right, and so looking at this, you might think what happens to the Romanian gradient sequence? Well, the noise passes right through linearly. And I, in fact, here, this is an error. This should be projected onto the tangent space of the function, but this is almost true with, with with, with up to a, a tangent projection. And so um, we're able to basically go through and generalize sort of classical results of um, um, saddle point avoidance with random perturbations um, to show that almost surely this iterate sequence will not converge to an active strict saddle point. Now, going back to our earlier result about the prevalence of these, uh, about this active strict saddle points is that uh, we, we get our main conclusion, which is that these perturbed subgradient methods converge only to local minimizers of generic semi-algebraic weakly convex functions. So now we know at least these things are converging to local minimizers. We don't know how close those are to global minimizers, but this is a lot stronger than what we knew before, which is um, uh, convergence to critical points. So we have a variety of extensions on, in the paper. This is a, a paper that we wrote during the summer with my student Li Wei Zhang uh, to proximal methods or projected subgradient methods. Um, and we also have results that go beyond weak convexity to Clark regularity and some results even beyond that um, in the paper. And more generally, the techniques that we, we develop here where uh, we've basically shown that the, the iteration sequence is a Riemannian gradient sequence along the manifold, sort of broadly applicable. We also use it to show that um, stochastic gradient methods um, with, with, with projection, with, sorry, with uh, constraints um, have um, uh, asymptotic normality so asymptotic normality guarantees for, for, for stochastic gradient methods um, can similarly be established by a similar um, inequality. So um, in any case, that's, I think, all I wanted to, to share with you today. So I guess I will thank you for listening and um, we'll put up a couple of references. Oh, thank you very much for a beautiful talk. Very nice results, very good presentation. 
Are there questions? Manuel Bombs. Yes, thank you also from my side for this enlightening talk. I, I, I miss a bit the intuition about your statement that the responsible eigenvalue of the Jacobian has to be real. I understand in a settle point uh, situation you have uh, with the, in 2D, you have a real eigen, any settle point must have a real eigenvalue, a two basically because of the, because of the trace. But, but here, I don't see why this must be the case. It's not, a, it, so um, I will say that I also don't see why it should be the case. Uh, the proof that we have is not like a, an enlightening proof. It's essentially like really checking kind of crazy computations. Um, uh, so I guess the simplest case um, is that the Hessian, the Jacobian of this mapping, at least for the proximal point mapping, is related to the Hessian of the Moreau envelope oh. in a strong way. And that's why we'll have it. But more sure, generally, it's, it's much more complicated. By symmetry, I see. Yeah. But it has implications, of course, because it means that you, if, if you happen to be close, there is no, no, oscillation, no oscillation possible. Mm. And in, in this sense, it, you're, 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 your sketches are, mm, I, I, I don't want to criticize it, but it could lead to the wrong intuition that there is a sort of oscillation around the manifold, right? Oh, in this Whereas case, yes. there should be an asymptotic motion like this. Yes, that's not- A monotonicity, that's yeah. let's say it like this. Yeah, that's exactly right. In fact, the algorithms reach the active manifold in finite time, they identify. Ah, yes. My next question. Finite time, yeah. so, so active set identification in finite time you get. Yes, yes, yeah. Okay. Do so, we have an so estimate about the number of iterations in terms yeah. of some parameters? Sorry yeah, you can always... Oh, sorry. Many questions. <laughs> no worries. No, I, I appreciate it. Um, we do have an estimate. Um, you can get the estimate from the lower bound on the norms of the subgradient. The, my screen is not showing anymore, but... We assume that we have an active manifold. So um, this ensures that the subgradients are lower bounded. If we know the sort of the speed, right, um, of that curve, then you can, you can estimate it directly in the key governing parameters, how big this is at every point. Um, I don't have it written down here, but you can compute it. It's, it's, it's fairly straightforward. It'll probably depend on like the school. Um, it'll depend on the function gap at the initial point to the manifold and then also um, uh, this minimal norm subgradient. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Are there other questions? Um, so uh, I would have a question. So can, can you please go to the proxy linear algorithm? Oh, at the beginning? Yeah, I mean, okay. yeah, so, yeah, sure. So th there was a, there was this nice table with many colors. Ah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, okay. So, so what we have there is, yeah, we, we have several terms, but we have a composition of a convex function yeah, with a linear operator. Yeah? And, mm -hmm. and then when, when minimizing these, this actually asks for an inner loop. Yes. Yeah. So like, uh, yeah, we will we have to solve a, the problem by using, let's say, a primal dual algorithm. Yeah. Okay. Then the question is: Is there a good modification of this method yeah, in the spirit of uh, a full splitting algorithm, for which yeah, the same results apply? Oh, um, no, <laughs> no. I mean, I don't even know if there is a. Like if you want to apply like sort of a nonlinear shamble pot type of algorithm. No, no, um, no, 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 no linear, but it's, it's a convex problem. Yeah. So you have H composed with a, with a linear function. Yeah. But then the right, right. Fine mapping, yes. And the question so the two, is, yeah. yeah. I, I agree. So there's two, there's two ways of looking at it. There's basically like, can we replace the prox linear sub problem with say a primal dual update? Yes, yes. That would be a nonlinear shamble pot type of strategy. And I don't know if there are any guarantees for that yet. There was something I thought about for like three years ago or so, but I never, never got anywhere. 
Second question is, can you solve the inner problems uh, in exactly and how in exact can you make them? Okay. We have a paper where we sort of look at that um, later on. Um, and basically you have to solve it very, very, very close to exact. It okay. depends on the ultimate epsilon that you want, but it's like epsilon to the minus 3.5. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you need to, you can't, you need to add perturbations okay. to the algorithm, yeah. Since in similar cases here for some methods, it is sometimes enough here to make just one step of this other algorithm, eh? not to, let's yeah. say, not, not to do a full running or whatever, you know, to come very close to the solution. Yeah. It just, com just, just do the, the outer iteration and one step mm -hmm. here of this, yeah, let's say, clever method. This is enough for some methods. And the question is if you know, one could use such, an, such a technique or such an idea here as well. Yeah? So you could, I think you could do something like that. I mean, it depends on what, because like, okay, so, but I don't think it would work. Like our, our arguments wouldn't work for this case for mm -hmm. randomly initialized algorithms, but for okay. the perturbed algorithms, you could probably do something like this. Okay. You add perturbations, yeah. Okay, thank you. Sure. So are there other questions? I just noticed before a, a, a microphone which was unmuted. Um, okay, so it's like kind of disappeared. The unmuted microphone. So then, yeah, then. Um, Okay, so so then of course uh, there are there are plenty of of, uh, of uh, other first order methods. Yeah, I mean uh, the question is uh, how much can one go beyond these three methods to consider here? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, if you want to apply the stable manifold argument, you will have to do a computation, hard one, to check out the Jacobian of that mapping. Um, mm -hmm. and that, that will require some work. Um, and it's, yeah, it's not, it's not obvious how to do it always. Um, we don't have like a, like our technique is kind of mysterious. I wouldn't say like it's good tech. It's like enlightening. Um, but, uh, for the other algorithms, for the other the perturbed methods, mm -hmm. essentially like any, any, basically any sort of subgradient type method, anything. So basically the key, maybe I can just say this slightly differently. The key is that um, if you look at a variety of iterative methods in tangent directions to the active manifold, they will look like Riemannian gradient sequences along the manifold. And it's true for projected or proximal sub type subgradient methods. It's true if you replace um, the this with a auto differentiation type procedure, like mm -hmm. it's true, like whenever, basically it, it's, it's very flexible, essentially, like for for um, un under the right assumptions, which are, which will hold generically. So as long as you have those two um, regularity arguments, so basically what you need is two things: you need to approach the active manifold very quickly, mm -hmm. and you need to ensure that you're not varying too much in tangent directions with your with your update function, or at least the non-smooth part of your objective. And in that case, you can you can port the arguments, yeah. So this one's a lot more flexible than the stable manifold type yes. argument. Yep. Okay. But slow, slower, very slow. Uh -huh. Because it, they don't; these algorithms don't converge linearly because you have to add noise. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. I have a question. Yeah. Please. So how, how do you define active manifold in general? In general? Yeah. It depends on who you are. Um, for us, we <laughs> went, went with the simplest. Um, the simplest example, which was that, um, you know, there, I think we actually, I think I defined it for us, an active manifold is simply, um, a function function as an active manifold. If there's a manifold in the domain, the function is C2 along that manifold and the function grows sharply in the sense that it's sub gradients are lower bounded in the neighborhood of that manifold, except on the manifold itself. So it has that structure. That's how we define active manifolds. There's a variety of other concepts like um, Steve, Steve Wright has, has the, the sort of earliest concept. 
And then there's sort of the BU type things. There's um, uh, Adrian Lewis has partial smoothness, um, which is a little bit more stringent than this, but the most probably the most closely related. Um, and so, yeah, it really just depends on, on, on who you are. This is like the minimal assumption I think you need. You need to get to the manifold quickly and then you need to be smooth along it. So, but in general, we don't know much about the, uh, the uh, objective function. So how do you identify or adaptively identify such kind of structure? We don't how do know we much about the effort, right, in, in practice. So yeah, so the, the, the result basically um, says that you do identify the active manifold if you stay within a neighborhood around it forever. Uh, mm -hmm. the, we, we don't need to know it. We just land inside of it eventually, like these algorithms. That's, that was sort of the key, um, the key mm -hmm. reason why everything worked. Um, so when we're nearby, the sharpness condition will ensure that common algorithms identify. Basically, if you have any algorithm along which your subgradients are tending to zero, then you have to be inside the manifold eventually because every, any, the only point with small subgradients is in the manifold. Mm -hmm. So that's the key, that's the key way of looking at it. It's like the subgradients tending to zero, if you're inside the manifold. Okay. So another question that, uh, for example, if we, we have like a two equally good minimizer, uh, you just landed uh, on one of them. So uh, how we can justify which one uh, and the one we we ha hope to have? Oh, um, I mean, that would be very application specific, I guess. Um, in our result, we don't really cover that, but I guess like if I was in practice, like solving, let's say a machine learning type of problem, I mean, I would want the one that has better generalization guarantees. And that can be formulated in a number of ways, like how, how flat, like people now talk about like flat versus sharp minimum, things like that. But it would, it really depends on the, the application context, which local minima you would want. Obviously a better one would be like, if you have a smaller objective value, but it's not clear. Um, mm -hmm. oh, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Jonathan? Yeah, so this VU thing reminded me of um, the other place I've seen that used. There's some papers by Claudia and Bob Mifflin. Yeah, that's where right. they that's, do, that's, where they do, yeah. um, they actually managed to do Newton on the smooth part. Mm -hmm. Any hope to, to generalize to that setting? Um, I think so. Um, I mean, like their result basically uh, basically requires a couple things like, or, or actually maybe the best way of thinking about it is like um, Aris Stanilaitis and Jerome Malik and I think Warren Hare have this paper um, from 2009 or something called like predictor corrector view of U VU type methods. Mm -hmm. And they basically identify the VU type method as like an algorithm that sort of implicitly projects onto the um, active manifold and then runs a Newton step. So like what you're saying is, is true, but in the original VU work, they weren't identifying it as a manifold. They were calling it like the fast track. It was kind of a different, slightly different perspective, yeah. but it, it is the same, same but sort it was, of operation. I guess it was, they, they were projecting onto it, but they, they didn't know when they were actually, they kept, they kept up, you know, they wouldn't know when they actually were projecting onto it, but they eventually would be. Yeah. But, I mean, it wouldn't, be, it wouldn't be useful for super, um, large scale problems, but for smaller scale problems, you might, you know, get that type of algorithm would get like much faster local convergence. And then, you know, be nice to know that it wasn't to a saddle point as well. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I haven't thought about combining it with what they have because our saddle point results kind of require weird perturbations. And I think like the arguments that they have are essentially that you get a sufficient decrease like the, the identification of the manifold involves like solving some proximal bundle sub problem yeah and i'm not sure if they actually if the uh, analyzing the operator there would be kind of crazy but yeah. and so stable manifold theorems wouldn't really make sense and then perturbations would slow you down yeah like, i don't know i mean it, it i thought it was really interesting work but i never actually saw it applied you know practically yeah, no, it's really interesting, yeah. yeah. Um.
Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Are there other questions? I have uh, another question, last question. So uh, Boris Poyak promoted his uh, yeah, momentum algorithms yeah, in the following way. He said, this is a good way yeah, just to detect different local minima yeah, by, by, by just by, by playing around with the inertial coefficient, you know, with the, with the momentum parameter. Okay, what would, what would happen yeah, with, with these results if one would use momentum, uh, yeah, let's say moment, momentum, Parameter, momentum constructs, momentum ideas in the algorithms. <laughs> That's really interesting. I've I have no idea. I mean, I've seen your papers actually where you where you show you have like I remember this plot, this particular plot in one of your figures where you're bouncing yes. around between them with some momentum. Yes. Um, and I've also seen some like the machine learning communities also has something like this too. Um, I'm trying to think if that would give you anything. I mean, I guess like you would hope that the momentum directions are pointing in descent directions. Why would they, why, how would you model that? Um, you would hope that maybe they're giving you like a um, second order information somehow, but it's not clear how to get that from or, there. Or, or the impact would, would be a negative one, yes, yes. I don't know, I mean, probably you would, I don't know. It's hard to say. Yeah? Or you would That's just an interesting question. Yeah. You would just 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 double. Okay, what what you are doing? Hey, like you know, the escaping of. Yeah, what's the other point? I don't. Know. I mean. Yeah. No, it's really interesting. I don't. <laughs> yeah, I I don't know how to think about it. Yeah. Yes. But it will probably take some time. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. So then let us stop here. Thank you very much for a great talk. We had uh, uh, many participants. Today in our in our Zoom, Zoom today, so uh, yeah, great success. So very nice talk, yeah, uh, very Thank nice you. topic. Uh, we I'm will uh, happy to be here. post uh, the video and the slides on our website. We just would like to announce that uh, our speaker next week will be Konstantin Michenko from Kaos. So we wish you all the best. Awesome. Have a nice week. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you bye. very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you.